Jesus. Someone left me a note in the pulpit this morning, I think. It says, seeing only him. I don't know who did that, but thank you. I've been praying um, that as I come to the pulpit weekly that I would step aside, that we would see but Christ. So if you left that note for me, thank you. Um, one of my, uh, I guess, preaching heroes, the prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, one time walked to the pulpit and someone left him a note. And it said something like, fool on it. And he stood up and he said, uh, someone has left me a note, but they only left their name. <laughs> so um, if you have encouraging notes, please leave them. If not, send it to uh, Richard at martinsburgchurch.org and he'll field those for us. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Well, we've got a ways to go. If this is your first time, I'm really glad that you're here, and uh, hopefully you can see that we, we really believe what we say we believe. We thank God that we are, are able to be a part of his work in Martinsburg and also to the ends of the earth, and we pray that these waters would continue to be stirred for the glory of Christ's name. And so if you're looking to be a part of a family here, we would love to, uh, to help, you know, help you along in that process. If you would download our app, that'd be a great way for you to just let us know. Hey, I want to get connected. I want to learn more about what you guys believe or let us know how we could be praying for you. You can drop a connect card. Pre-COVID days, as you'd come in on a Sunday, we'd give you a loop. It was a bulletin. You'd find some things in there that maybe would help you understand how to be a part of what's going on. And we have that available to you on the app digitally. A little tile there. You click the loop, and you'll find a couple of things going on. And I want to highlight two of those. There's a prayer gathering that we have in person and online the last Tuesday of every month. And so that's coming up, as well as another prayer event for, um, for the females of our church. It's a prayer brunch. You can get the details in in the loop, and so I'm grateful for uh, Pastor Terry and for Chrissy Seelinger, who are, who's leading that effort. So, um, I've also been sharing with you over the last couple of weeks that we are praying and preparing for ch our children's ministry, G4, to be opening back up, and that's happening March 7th during the 11 o'clock service only. And so at this point, um, our desire and plan has been for us to gather enough volunteers to be able to open up three different classes. We want to um, provide space for children, at least right now, from the ages of six weeks all the way up to pre-K. And uh, that is still our desire. Uh, and at this point, though, we have uh, received enough volunteers to sign up so that we could have two classes. And so we are grateful for those that have um, jumped in and are intending to serve. Um, but our plan right now at this point is to move forward as such, unless we have some more folks sign up. And so if you have been intending to register and you just kind of been forgetting, which I trust is hopefully all of you. Okay, maybe not. Um, <laughs> You can go to the app, hit the sign-up tile, and uh, fill out a serving form, and we will get you on a, a monthly rotation where you'll be serving um, families of this church. You just think about how kids are being influenced everywhere. TV, school, you name it. Daycare. And we have a unique opportunity to influence kids with the things of God. Let's not take that lightly. Let's not just see this as an, an hour of the week of inconvenience, but an hour of opportunity. So I'd encourage you to think on these things and, and jump in if you feel so compelled. Lastly, I want to remind you, members, that we have a members meeting tonight right here at 6 o'clock. I personally am pretty excited about this. In November uh, of 2020, we shared this vision of where we're going in 21. And today, uh, we're, tonight, we're going to be able to share some updates as what that's looked like and where we're going this year. And so hopefully you are making plans to attend. It's going to be a good time. And so that's tonight. Make sure that, uh, you RSVP. Pastor Richard, send an email out with that link uh, so that you have what you need. But looking forward. I'm really looking forward to that. Lastly, we're going to pray and jump into a new series, which I'm really um, anxiously excited about. But before we do that, I want to uh, let you know who we're going to be praying for today. Each week we gather and we pray for a different street that our members are living on. Um, thinking about Habakkuk 2 last week, and it says that the glory of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So today we're going to pray that would be the case for Renaissance Drive, that the glory of God would cover Renaissance Drive as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your grace to us that we can, we can be with you. We can be known by you, which is a terrifying reality that you would know us through and through. We, we are really good at putting on masks, pretending like we've got our lives together, that we're good people. But deep down, we know ourselves, and you do too. And the fact that you would send your son to give us a new heart is beyond anything that we could have ever thought to ask for. We thank you for Jesus. We come to you now through the work that he has done, and we ask that he would be the one exalted, that truly I would step aside 
and that Christ would be lifted high. Lord, as we approach such a precious passage in Romans 14 today, we pray that you would open our eyes to behold wondrous things of your word. Not would we just behold, but would we understand, would we apply. So help us to live a life worthy of the call that you've placed upon us. For those in this room that are Christians, those online that are followers of Christ, we pray these things for us. For those that don't know you, Lord, we pray that today, through the preaching of your word and the work of your spirit, you would reveal yourself to those far from you, that these waters would continue to be stirred. We thank you for Megan. We pray for, pray for her and Nathaniel and their family, that you would bless them and grow them. We're glad they're here. And for uh, Dennis and Lisa and their community group, as they lead them and bless them, oh, may this just be the beginning of many years of faithfulness unto you as they see your love for them. So have your way among us, and we pray um, for our city. We pray for those on Renaissance Drive, that you would give them a deep desire to make you known. Lord, help them to not grow so busy in the midst of life to forget that you've placed them there on Renaissance so that they could be a light in the midst of darkness. We trust, Lord, that you are moving and working on that street, and so we ask that you would um, just place your people in the flow of your work, that they would be faithful unto you. And may your glory cover that neighborhood as the waters cover the sea. May it be so among us today, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, here we are. Romans 14. I've been studying, thinking, praying, talking lots over the last couple of months ahead of this, and I'm not really sure where to start, but I suppose I'll start with this. If you long for this, watch out. Sin is probably creeping at your door, and if you're caught in the act, then church discipline will most assuredly be in order. And if you associate, if you associate with others that are partaking in this you might as well join them because you are soon to fall off of the edge and into the abyss yourself. This is serious business, and if you don't heed my words, beloved, and you very well may not be a Christian, don't mess with it. Stay away from it. Don't associate with others who do it. The question I'm sure in your mind is, what is it? Any guesses, maybe? If you don't know, then shame on you. It, of course, is dancing. It's dancing. Dancing, it ought to be removed far from us. And if you aren't sinning already, then the lust that creeps up within you through your dancing will most assuredly cause you to sin. The Holy Spirit within you will convict you of your dancing. And if your dancing doesn't bring conviction, then maybe the Holy Spirit is not within you in the first place. Some preachers have even gone so far as to say that parishioners should avoid intimacy because it might lead you to dancing. Is this true? Is dancing a sin? This heinous act of supposed sin was once a hot-button issue in local churches and not long ago. In fact, many today even hold to this belief. Is it true, though? It seems ridiculous to some, but not to others. And how are we to handle matters like these? Matters that the Bible neither, neither commands nor forbids. What is literally defined in the Greek as matters of indifference. Let me give you a few to think about. What about matters of entertainment? Can Christians, can we watch R-rated movies? What about secular music? Can we listen to it? Is it okay if I don't want to drink fair trade coffee? Can my, re my kids read Harry Potter? What if I don't want to homeschool my kids? The list goes on. Can Christians smoke cigars, have tattoos, watch mixed martial arts? Now don't hear me defending or defaming any of these. The point in this list is simply to highlight the fact that we, if you're a Christian in this room, we Christians will be faced with all sorts of decisions when it comes to matters of indifference. Now, thankfully, we are not left to our own wisdom, our own logic, our own tradition or experience. The word speaks to these things in some sense. Now, these aren't unimportant matters, but they should never be elevated uh, to top tier matters. The sad reality, though, is that's exactly what has happened and continues to happen. You see, we can so easily be divided on lesser matters that would lead one to question really the power of the blood of Christ which is to be the binding agent among us, despite our differences on such lesser things. And when, uh, when that happens, we simply miss the point. We, we no longer embody liberty and charity, but legalism and censorship. And for Christ's sake, this must not be the case among us. 
And so here we are, breaking from the gospel according to Mark for three weeks so that we can together give thought to our liberty and charity. Liberty, it speaks to the absolute freedom that we have been given in Christ. Freedom from sin, freedom from condemnation, from eternal wrath, freedom from the burden of the law, and freedom into a life of radical grace. You see, Jesus has extended this freedom to us all through the life he lived on our behalf, the death that he died for us, and the victory that he secured for us by rising from the dead. It's a good place for you to amen. And when we place our faith in him alone, he gives us that freedom. That is true liberty. And then we have charity. Charity speaks to how God expects his people, us, those who have placed our faith alone in Christ for salvation, how we are to use that liberty. Think of this. Well, one of our nation's founding fathers, Patrick Henry, is often remembered for those famous words, give me liberty or give me now, for those of us that appreciate American ideals such as this one, we have to be careful. You see, we can easily fall into the trap that thinking because we have liberty in Christ, we are free to go about and do whatever we want in order to pursue our own life, our own liberty, and our own pursuit of happiness. The Bible slams the brakes on that, and it clears the air for us. Yes, there is liberty in Christ. But instead of give me liberty or give me death, we ought to be marked by another saying. Jesus gave me liberty through his own death. And now we must ask the question, what are we to do with such profound freedom? We find the answer, of course, in Romans chapter 14. That's the point of this sermon series. For us, for believers, to get, to get a, a better grasp upon this liberty that we have in Christ while gaining a truer understanding of, of how charity toward fellow believers is to flow from that blessed liberty. That's where we're going over the next three weeks. And if you have taken my recommendation, then what I'm about to share with you will not be new. In this book right here, which belongs to Rebecca Lee, you won this on Facebook some time ago. I've failed to get it to you, so... Come get this. <laughs> Finding the right hills to die on is what it's called. And in this book, he provides some really helpful categories for us to be thinking about. A ranking system, if you will, that teaches us how to prioritize matters of theological importance. And he gives us four basic categories that will be on the screen for you. First rank beliefs are essential to the gospel itself. We could say that this, an example of this would be the authority of the Bible or the sufficiency of the scriptures. Uh, uh, is it enough? What do we think of the Bible? This would be a, a first rank doctrine. Second rank beliefs are, are urgent for the health and practice of the church, such that they frequently cause Christians to separate at the level of local church, denomination, and or ministry. This would include matters like baptism. Then we have third rank beliefs, which are important to Christian theology, but not enough to justify separation or division among Christians. Now, this would include matters that maybe some of us have never even heard of, which quite frankly is, is just fine. But uh, creation, what do we believe about creation or what about the millennium? And then we have fourth rank beliefs. These are unimportant, hear, hear, hear this, unimportant to our gospel witness and ministry collaboration. And it's here it is here. We cannot miss this. If we miss this, the whole series is jacked for you. This section right here, fourth rank beliefs, it's here where we're going to camp because it's where Paul camps in Romans 14. Now, we're going to be spending the next three weeks discussing this final tier, unimportant ones to our gospel witness. Now, I want you to hear me. I'm going to say this a bunch. These are not unimportant in general. But in relation to our gospel witness, they should not be placed upon a, a theological pedestal. And even in that statement, I recognize it might ruffle some feathers. So just bear with me as we march through the text over the next couple of weeks with the Spirit's help. And as we dip our toes into Romans 14, we find the Apostle Paul continuing his explanation of how the gospel should influence the entire Christian life. The book of Romans is, is more, more like a long letter, really, than it is a book. And Paul is writing to a local church just like ours, and they and we need some help understanding what it means to be and live as Christians. Uh, last week, Pastor Aaron did such a helpful job from Romans chapter 12, and before he got to the text, he kind of set us up to understand the context. I want to remind us of that. You see, Romans 1 through 11 is full of Paul's spirit-inspired attempt to reveal the beauties 
of the person and work of Jesus. Then once he concludes chapter 11, he then transitions in the letter to begin to explain what we do about it, right? We could say it this way. Romans 1 through 11 provide gospel indicatives, what God has already done on our behalf in Christ, while the rest of the letter provides gospel imperatives. Now what are we to do as a result of being in Christ? Am I making sense? Am I tracking with me? Okay, so we find ourselves right on the heels of Paul explaining the beauty of brotherly love and affection. We don't pluck Romans 14 from the rest of the letter and treat it separately. Rather, we have to realize that it is where it is for a reason. And Paul, he's explaining what what love of neighbor looks like and and what it means to, to have fellowship in the local church marked by agape, spiritual love. And as we turn the page to Romans chapter 14, Paul begins to explain how we are to be handling matters of opinion. Now it's clear that he's talking about this fourth tier of belief that I've referenced earlier that's still right here up on the screen. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it's clear that he's talking about, about these things um, from the text and as we begin to understand it a little, a little bit more. You see, if we wrongly ap- apply the principles of Romans 14 to these other tiers, then we are going to be causing all sorts of undue difficulty in our thoughts and our beliefs and in our life. So we're not talking about matters of sin. We're not even talking about matters of great theological importance. We are considering matters of indifference. So repeat after me, matters of indifference. One more time, matters of indifference. Great. Another way to say it is these are the gray areas of life where the Bible neither commands nor forbids specific thoughts, beliefs, or actions. My heart has truly been heavy over the last year. As I have seen a number of issues that, biblically speaking, aren't super important, being elevated to a position of importance that they just don't deserve. And now I don't intend to get in the weeds with these hot button issues. That just wouldn't be helpful, and quite frankly, my opinion is not what God has charged me to share with you. Rather, we need to know what the Bible says, and my hope is that we will learn from the Scriptures the help that's available, and how, how we should understand how to live with one another when we disagree with issues that the Bible is okay with us disagreeing about. We ain't talking about sin, right? We remember that. We're talking about matters that don't affect our Christian witness, matters of indifference. So this sermon series has been stirring lots of prayer, conversation, reading, study. So may God use it for his glory and the unity, unity of this church. And so with the stage set, I'd invite you now to turn to Romans chapter 14. We'll start in verse 1. It'll be on the screen. Romans chapter 14, verse 1. This is what it says. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may, he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person may esteem one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one, verse 5 says, should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For no, none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather to never decide, or rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother." quite the text and is just the beginning. And the text answers the million dollar question. How do broken people of various backgrounds find unity despite their differences? Is it politics? Is it worldview maybe? Hobby? Stage of life? Is the melting pot pretty on paper but impossible in practice? See, we all feel strongly about these fourth tier beliefs. 
We have to discern, though, with the help of the Spirit, whether or not we are guilty of making them more important than the Bible does. And when we do that, we, uh, we're attempting to make our preferences the law of the church. You see, that happens among us today, just as it did among Paul's time as he's writing to the church at Rome. And so what I want to do is, over the next couple of minutes this morning, unpack uh, these first 13 verses. And as I do, my hope is that we would consider together the charitable postures that enable us to enjoy abiding unity. This is my goal today. My goal is to persuade you from the text that while the church must be unified in matters of first importance, we are called to extend charity toward one another in matters of indifference. That is my goal, to understand these things. And it is a tall task. And we we have a lifetime to learn how this will flesh out, but I pray these next three weeks will help us as we set our feet upon this path. And so the postures, postures of Romans 14 that ought to be found among God's people. The first is found in the first four verses. For the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats abstain the one, or despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or fall, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. First posture that we should consider that will enable us to enjoy abiding unity is one that is ready to welcome one another in Christ. Another way to put it, don't only welcome those that you get along with. I want to illustrate this sort of posture by giving you a picture of the opposite. Imagine uh, you're in traffic during the busiest time of day. You're, you're over by Gabe's um, on Route 9, and it's where everybody's either trying to get to 81 or Chick-fil-A. Hopefully, I'll know what I'm talking about right now, right? So you, you're approaching the light, and you think that you're going to make it, but uh, it turns yellow. And so you feel strongly that yellow actually means slow down and not speed up. Whatever. Anyways, the car in, behind you interprets it correctly, gasses it, thinking that y'all are on the same page. Right, row. So, here you are, having been rear-ended after a stressful day, looking forward to sinking your teeth into that spicy chicken sandwich, but now you have to deal with this mess. <laughs> Somebody amen that. <laughs> have mercy. You get out of the car, and you start stomping back to your bumper to assess the damage, and the person that hits you walks up. You're furious. You want to choke them out. Your posture is one of animosity, right? You're tense. You're ready to fight or scream or just cry. Like, that's what I mean when I say posture. It's, it's the attitude with which you approach a person or a situation. And when we disagree with, on these matters of indifference, whatever that might be for you, we often feel so strongly that we adopt the same kind of posture. Am I right? Well, Paul says we ought to approach these issues of indifference with a warm, gentle posture, ready to welcome one another in Christ. As for the one who is weak, he says, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. So Paul introduces this thought with some language that's sort of interesting. Now it's implied, and he's writing to the strong ones, right? As he's mentioning the weak. If there are weak, then there certainly have to be some strong ones. So is, this, is this physical strength? Emotional intelligence? Like, what is he talking about? Now, we won't find this word in the text, but what Paul is just talking about is the conscience. It's the little voice in your head. We all have it, right? Either we listen to it, we are slaves to it, or we completely ignore it, and we sear it until it just goes away. Whatever the case may be, we all have a conscience, and the ongoing work of the Christian is to train his or her conscience to align with the Scriptures, now, this may draw some imagery from your past, right? You've got the angel on one shoulder and the little devil on the other, right? The angel saying, do good, do good, do good. And the, and the devil's like, come on, man. You can just go do that a little bit. You'll be all right. We can kind of, we can appreciate that because there's, there's this war raging within us. And it, it resonates as we feel this internal tension. And according to Paul, one's conscience evidently can either be strong or weak. Well, how might that be? You see, Paul recognizes that his audience as we find ourselves to be, is a great mixture of all sorts of people. 
Now, some in Paul's day were of pagan background. Some would be found of Jewish background and so forth. And when a, a group of people, it's the truth that remains throughout, throughout the ages, when a group of people from different backgrounds and traditions and practices come together, it's fixing to be a mess, right? We all bring our baggage, our long-held traditions, some good, some acceptable, <laughs> some not. Well, the, weak, the weak conscience that Paul is referencing is the one who, listen, the one who feels pressed to include or remove a thought, belief, or practice that the Bible doesn't actually require. This person has not yet come to grips with the freedom, with the liberty that Christ has obtained on their behalf. And then the gray areas that we'll look at through Romans chapter 14, we find them in our lives today, and they are strongly influenced by each of our own consciences. And so as we go through the process of calibrating our conscience to the scriptures through reading, meditation, and study, we will, with the help of God, grow from one stage of maturity to the next. And so in, Paul, in light of that, Paul calls believers to welcome one another in Christ, not to quarrel, not to look down upon the weak, not to bring the weak one into our inner circle just to persuade them but to welcome them as God has welcomed us. Let me just hit pause for a minute. The fact that God would welcome us, the maker of heaven and earth, the one upon the throne, welcomes us. It's a mesmerizing thought, and I wonder if at times we can find division so easily because we think about the things that divide us instead of the gospel which is intended to unite us that God would welcome us. Could you imagine? But the fact remains, there may be some among us that believe differently about some things. Maybe it is dancing. That dancing, it should be avoided at all costs. And there are some here, I'm sure, that would not agree with that. And this is the type of matter that Paul is addressing the one who is weak, those adding a requirement that God doesn't, is to be welcomed by the strong, the one fully aware of freedom in Christ. And that's evident when he provides a real-time example. Verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Now, a glance at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, it brings some help. Helps us realize that this these thoughts about eating isn't over, you know, who has the better chicken sandwich, Chick-fil-A or Popeye's. It actually runs much deeper, believe it or not. There was a, a newly formed church in the ancient city of Corinth, and those people were wild. It's like church gone wild in that place. Paul, he's grieved by what he's heard about their sinfulness, and so he writes them two, not one, two letters, First and Second Corinthians. And it's clear that Jesus in this place and in this time has rescued many pagans from Corinth. That is those who would worship false idols. And he would, he would rescue these pagans and then set them on a path of true holiness according to the Bible. However, it would be hard for these former pagans to, to shake their old traditions and practices. Now certainly we can, we can understand that, right? I mean, many have found that following Jesus doesn't just mean learning a new way of life but unlearning an old way as well. And these former pagans would often struggle uh, to place their whole trust in Christ alone. So during their pagan years, it was their practice to offer sacrifices to, to false gods and then sell the meat in the marketplace afterwards. And when those pagans then become followers of Jesus, they, they would find themselves struggling with this new freedom they have in Jesus. Now, Paul and the other strong Christians, they don't have the same hang-up. They knew that the gods that the pagans worshipped were, were false gods, and that the one true God was the maker of all, including the animals that those pagans were sacrificing. So Paul is rightly convinced that the meat is okay for him to eat. But the former pagans, those with the weak conscience, they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat because they still felt strongly that it was uh, associating them with false idol worship. Now that wasn't true, according to Paul, but their, their conscience bound them to believe it to be so. They were fully convinced in their mind, as 14 verse 5 would say. And so Paul, in Romans 14, 1, says that those that are weak, the former pagans, must be welcomed in Christ by those who are strong, those secure in their liberty. This is tough stuff for us to think about. And it is a lifelong journey to understand how to live with one another with these types of differences. Because it can be tiring, frustrating, and just downright obnoxious, if I'm going to be honest. 
I mean, we can, as a people, understand objectively that some matters aren't supposed to be elevated. That's easy. We can admit it. The problem comes, though, when we grow to feel so strongly about one of these matters that we're blinded by our passions, and we end up making it a more important matter than what it actually is, and then we feel justified in it. we got to move away from that as we calibrate our conscience to the Word. And as we do, may we grow more faithful in our ability and desire to welcome one another in Christ. But Paul goes on, one person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord. Simply put, the next posture that enables us to enjoy abiding unity is this. Believe the best of one another. Believe the best of one another. Look how easy is it to judge, to judge the motives of others. Like from a distance, right, we see from the outside and feel justified in making a decision about the heart of a fellow believer. Well, they didn't really do it the way that I would have. I can't understand how they could have come to that conclusion. You know, the Bible doesn't let you do those things. This isn't the way of Christian charity. That's the way of the world. Because, Because of the liberty we've been given through the shed blood of Christ, we are enabled to believe the best of one another. If he does this fully convinced in his mind, he does it unto the Lord. This is what Paul tells us to, to believe. And this, of course, is the way of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, what assure us of these things, that love believes all things. And according to Jesus, we show that we are his disciples by one chief thing, what? Our love for one another. And thus we are enabled to live in harmony with a fellow believer who is led by their conscience to handle a matter of indifference. One of those gray areas where the Bible doesn't forbid or command, they handle it differently than how we would handle it. And in so doing, what happens when we embrace one another in Christ, believing the best of one another? We show the power of the cross, which is that which truly makes the melting pot possible, where sinners of former traditions, creeds, and lifestyles are not conformed to one another, but transformed into something altogether better, altogether more beautiful. The image of Christ. We don't need a bunch of little AJs running around. We need a bunch of little Jesuses running around. It's a beautiful thing. And verse 6 is the key to this posture. And it's the reason we can, in charity, believe the best of one another. Verse 6, the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. Believe the best of one another. Some things happening in the text and in the culture. Now, some would have referred to lucky and unlucky days as a way of pagan life. But that's not what Paul is referencing here in this passage. For if he was, Paul would have issued a rebuke to them just as he did to those in the church in Galatia. Paul, later on in Galatians chapter 4, verse 10, would find those who are adhering to former practices in uh, unnecessary and even sinful ways, and he reserves these words for him. You observe days and months and seasons and years? I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. But that's not the tone that he's speaking to the church at Rome about. Why? See, Paul teaches that, as one commentator would say, where the centrality of justification by faith was clear and the observance of a certain day or days was no more than a practice some believer found helpful was another matter. Now, for us, practically, are these conversations off limits? If you feel differently about a a matter of opinion than I do, should we just abstain from the conversation altogether? Well, no, of course not. We should discuss But if we are simply welcoming one another just to attempt to persuade, then we are in sin. And so if we can have a conversation and be happy to agree to disagree on these matters of indifference, then by all means, it would be a very very good thing for us to be in these discussions. And ultimately, even if in our conscience, it would in no way, shape, form, or fashion make space for a decision that a fellow believer has made, we have to be okay with that. Why? Why? The next posture makes that plain. Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. 
Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, this says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. See, members of local churches like ours, we are enabled to welcome one another in Christ, enabled to believe the best of one another, ultimately because we have a greater judge than our fallible consciences. Verses 9 through 12 lead us to the next posture that enables Christians to enjoy abiding unity, and it's this. Entrust one another to the judge. We are to entrust one another to the judge. I love, love, love how one commentator sums this posture up. Why then, asked Paul, do you weak believers, the abstainers, pass judgment on your brothers in Christ, those who do not abstain for the sake of conscience? God is their judge, not you. And turning to the strong believer, Paul asked why they held the weaker Christians in contempt. It was wrong for them to look down on their fellow believers who were not as yet able to set aside the regulations that had previously controlled their religious life. He concludes, each and every believer will stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, to be clear again, I know I've said it a half dozen times, I'm going to say it again. This is not in matters of sin. This is not. Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it makes it clear how churches are to handle matters of sin through the process of church discipline. This passage in Romans 14, not talking about matters of sin, but matters of indifference, where the Bible neither forbids nor commands specific thought, belief, or action. The reality is that on matters of conscience, we must live and function with one another under the truth that, this comes to make some of y'all uncomfortable, that we might be right or wrong. Thus, ultimately, we must trust that God will make that clear to us on the day of judgment. And so we prioritize unity and we entrust one another to the judge. And when we take the position that everything is black and white in Christianity, which it clearly is not, and then expect everyone to fall in line with how we view things, what happens? We become the judge, the jury, and the executioner, and that is not to be our role in matters of indifference. Rather, in Paul's mind, as conveyed through the Holy Spirit-inspired word, we must not die on hills of indifference. But that's exactly what we have been doing. And the content of these matters, really not all that important. But the disputes that arise from them among the people of God are... You see, we are free to have our opinions on these matters. But when we expect others to have the same opinions on these lesser things, we position ourselves as the authority. Listen to R.C. Sproul. No one can use this principle to participate in adultery or other sins. These precepts have to do with eating meat, observing certain days that have no direct bearing on the kingdom of God. The great danger is to allow these indifferent matters to become requirements for Christian spirituality and even worse, the test for what is spiritual and righteous. Unfortunately, that is what happens again and again. And through his perfect life, his sacrificial death, and his victorious resurrection from the dead, Jesus alone secures lordship to judge. Thus we entrust one another to him. And as we do, the final posture becomes a real possibility. Verse 13, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Our Christian liberty frees us to welcome one another in Christ. It enables us to believe the best of one another, and it compels us to entrust one another to the judge and and ultimately postures us to plan for the good of one another. See, so far in the the passage, there's been a lot of forbidding. Don't do this. don't Don't judge. Don't despise. And Paul says that withholding, though, it isn't enough. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather. You see, we have to be proactive in our consideration of these matters and how our thoughts, our beliefs, and actions affect fellow members. I'm going to say that again. We have to hear this. We have to be proactive in our consideration of these matters, of how our thoughts, our beliefs, and actions will affect fellow members. The text will lead us to consider this in greater detail next week, but Paul is saying here that we must not just stop judging, but we must make plans to clear the paths for others. Now, when we, it's the beauty of it, when we are committed to one another, not hopping churches until we found the perfect place, we grow to understand each other better. Our relationships grow as we welcome one another. A safe environment develops over time when we know that we have each other's backs. 
You see, there's nothing quite as refreshing as being around somebody who genuinely believes the best of others. Now, at first, it's probably a little convicting because y'all are trying to do a little gossip. But when we appreciate it for what it is, we're around somebody who genuinely believes the best of others. There's nothing like it. Nothing like it. This is what it means for us practically. Let's just take the dancing scenario. If you know a fellow brother or sister is bound by their conscience to not dance, then you don't invite them to go dancing. Simple. Don't send them a TikTok of somebody dancing. Simple. It's what it means to not throw a stumbling block before them. You don't have to agree, but you have to use your liberty in that situation to lay aside your freedom for the sake of another's conscience. And we know, we know, when we know we are free to differ with each other on these matters of indifference, the beauty of the gospel then begins to shine more brightly. It means that we've tested the substance of Christ and his work on our behalf, and we have found the melting pot, the church, to be what the Bible says it to be, a place where people of various pasts, experiences, and traditions can find a home and family where there was none. The gospel creates family. That's the melting pot. The world knows nothing of it, for it is not of this world. And so, liberty and charity. What a great gift God has given us in Christ. May we use it well. I want to invite you to just bow your head for a moment. I want to give you a very specific thought to course through your mind. Allow distractions to go to the side just for this moment. And I want to ask you, beloved brother, sister, are there areas in your life where you have abused this liberty and you've not extended charity to fellow believers? Are there areas in your life where you have abused this liberty and you have failed to extend charity to fellow believers? Would you be so bold to ask the Lord to search your heart? The band will come and we will sing in a moment. But take this time to ask the Lord these things. Am I guilty of that? And confess that to him. Make plans to confess it to others. And I can assure you that you will find great freedom there, which is exactly what Christ has paid for you. May this place be known as the melting pot for the good of Martinsburg, the glory of Christ Jesus.